So I've got a, I'm going to skip a lot of the slides in this second deck. So I'll just kind of do the interesting parts from remaining in this part, and then I'll switch to the third deck, which is about augmented Lagrangian and ADMM. It's a class of methods that's been very popular in um, signal processing applications. So I'll do about half of that deck, just with uh, kind of key ideas, OK? All right, so this is where we left off. We talked about a bunch of methods for um, first order methods for minimizing a smooth F. And <clears throat> now I want to extend them to the case where we're adding on a regularizer here, where this regularizer is usually convex but not smooth. And so, how do we extend these methods that we figured out uh, to deal with that? So, usually what we do is um, basically take a first order step in F, and then we incorporate the uh, regularization term explicitly, okay? So you can think of this as the basic uh, step that from, um, from xk, the current iterate, you do something just with f. So this operator here is something based on xk and grad f of xk usually. And maybe it also has some of those acceleration techniques that we talked about. And then you plug it into this formula and bring in this regularizer, which so far you've left out. This lambda should be equal to tau here. And um, what you get out of that is a new iterate at xk plus 1. I'm sorry, this should be a k plus 1 over here. Okay, so this is how you get, with a regularized formulation, this is how you get from one iterate to the next. So there's a whole bunch of slides here where we talk about the details of doing that, about subgradients, which I think you probably know about from Francis's talk uh, yesterday. So I'm doing a lot of skipping here. A um, bit about prox regulator, you know, we talked about some of this. I'm sure you're taking this all in. Okay, so here we are. This, this is where I uh, left off a moment ago. And this is the special case where we're taking a steepest descent step. Um, and so I've got this notation here, prox. And let me explain what that means. It just basically means a solution of that subproblem that I threw up earlier. <coughs> okay, so I define prox with respect to some function h of uh, some function y is just the minimum of one half uh, over x of one half um, x minus y two norm squared uh, plus h of x. Okay, so it basically accepts as its argument some something y, which in our case is a, a steepest descent step from the current xk, and then it brings in the h explicitly. Okay, so if h is not there, if h is the null function. The minimizer of this is just x equals y. So if there's no regularizer, we just get the steepest descent step. But if there is a regularizer, it solves this little subproblem to get the uh, <coughs> to get the steepest descent step. All right. So that's what's going on here. <coughs> and usually this is easy to solve. In the case where h is a one norm, for example, this breaks down and uh, this decomposes into single components of the vectors x and y. And you just get n scalar problems that you can just solve in closed form using that soft thresholding operation we talked about earlier. So usually solving the subproblem for a lot of practical regularization functions is very easy. Okay? So this is the basic extension of steepest descent to the case where we've got a regularizer. And uh, you can change a little bit. You can uh, make some various enhancements. You can bring in this lambda to make it if lambda is equal to 1, it's the basic steepest descent step. If not, it's some sort of relaxation where you might overshoot or undershoot. Um, and then you might make some errors here in the calculations, BK and AK. So this is kind of a generalized form of uh, steepest descent extended to the regularized case. And there's a paper uh, now 10 years old. It's a combat in WA from um, Paris I guess they are. And it shows that if you choose the alpha k, the step length parameter, to be between 0 and 2 over L, now this is pretty much the range that we can prove things about for just the smooth case. Remember in the smooth case, I took alpha to be 1 over L, which is what right in the middle of this range. You don't actually need to fix it at 1 over L, just as long as it's uh, you know, somewhere near that. Um, if you choose the relaxation parameters to just all be <coughs> in this range, <coughs> what we usually do is just choose them all to be 1, but this kind of generalizes that a little bit. And if the error is summed to less than uh, infinity, then all of this is guaranteed to converge. So it converges under pretty general conditions. 
Okay. So very often in many of the cases that we uh, have, like we had in compressed sensing, that function f is actually a least squares type function. So in the first talk I gave this morning, uh, where I dealt with the uh, compressed sensing case and proved exactness and all that, um, this is the kind of uh, case we had for f. So let's see what happens in that case. Let's see how this algorithm specializes for that case. Well, this is the basic step. So this here should be an xk. So from xk, we calculate bxk minus b. So that involves mostly a matrix multiplication involving b. We take that vector and multiply with b transpose. Okay. Then we do the subtraction, and then we do the prox operator. So you, usually the expensive part of this step uh, the multiplication by B here, matrix vector multiplication with B. And then we do a matrix vector multiplication with B transpose. Okay? These other operations are just uh, relatively small, order N or order M operations, including the prox operation. That's order N. Okay? So the thing about this is that in many applications, like in compressed sensing applications, it's possible to do these multiplications relatively efficiently, okay? So in compressed sensing, we use the, the notation A for this matrix this morning. One popular compressed sensing matrix is a, a row submatrix of the FFT. Okay, that's a, quite an effective sensing matrix. It tends to have those, those nice properties, like rip type properties that I talked about this morning. So if this is a submatrix of an FFT, you know that you can calculate the FFT in order n log n complexity. And then you just have to subsample down from that. So basically, the cost of each step is order n log n. Uh, wavelet transformations are if, if uh, B is some sort of submatrix of a wavelet matrix, again, you can do that you know, more efficiently than just the dimensions would suggest. Okay? There are efficient ways of operating with wavelet type matrices. And so for those kinds of applications, this is a very elementary algorithm that you can apply um, quite efficiently. <clears throat> now, for some, in this case, you can prove some more refined things about convergence, which I'll mention. And if the regularizer, in fact, is a one norm, we can say even more about how the convergence of this approach works. Okay. So this basic approach is known as um, IST, iter iterated shrinking and thresholding. And the distinctive features of this approach are that the alpha, the step alpha, is the same kind of short step that I talked about earlier. It's like a 1 over L step, or at least it's no bigger than 2 over L, where L is the maximum eigenvalue of the Hessian. The Hessian in this case is just B transpose B. Okay, it's just a constant matrix. <coughs> and L would be the maximum eigenvalue of that. So provided alpha is like that, we can prove that this whole approach um, converges. Now in the case that this is, this is the one norm, the regularizer is the one norm, we can even say more about this approach. We can say that it identifies the correct set of zeros in a finite number of iterations. Okay, so that after you've taken finitely many steps, the elements of x that are zero at the solution of the problem actually are zero at all of the iterates past a certain stage. And after that, the problem just collapses to minimizing, you know, figuring out what the true value of x is on the non-zero set. Okay, so at least you get the zeros right after a finite number of steps. And after that, you just have to iterate some more to get convergence on the non-zeros. So that's quite a strong result already right there. And in fact, the convergence behavior from then on, it doesn't depend on the conditioning of the Hessian. It just depends on the conditioning of the reduced Hessian. That is the Hessian just on the non-zeros. So I only need to look at the columns of B that correspond to, perversely, I've called Z, I've used Z here for the set of uh, oh, God, no, I've messed up the notation here. Um, this should be n. This should be the set of non-zeros, okay? So um, <coughs> we only need to look at the Hessian, the reduced Hessian corresponding to the non-zero components of x. And the condition of that is going to tell us how fast this method, method converges in the asymptotic stages after the zeros have been identified, okay? All right, so that was for the basic steepest descent um, algorithm extended to the regularized case. Now, you can also extend that Pfister approach that I talked about earlier. This is the accelerated Nesterov type approach. Um, in fact, the Pfister paper did already include 
uh, the extension to the regularized case. So it's all the same as basically very similar to Nesterov, except in this first step here, you're applying the prox operator. These other steps are, are just the same. And again, you need to restrict the alpha uh, to be less than 1 over L in this case. Um, and you get some benefit from that. You get, instead of the 1 over K rate, that is all you can prove for the unaccelerated first order method, you can get a 1 over K squared rate, which is typical of Nesterov. Okay, um, and this is kind of still a pessimistic rate, and it only uh, it's not taking account of the fact that eventually you find the right manifold. When you've got the right manifold, you're essentially dealing with a strongly convex problem, and after that, the convergence is linear. So, although this is faster than what you get for the classical weakly convex algorithm, it still doesn't really capture the true behavior of the method, which is eventually that it becomes linear rather than sublinear. Okay, this one I think I'll kind of skip over. Okay, uh, okay. I want to talk about the sparser method. And this is the one that we worked on in 2008, 2009. And basically, it's just the IST method, except that we're more aggressive about choosing step lengths. Because this idea of short step lengths in practice is not very fast. And you can often be a little bit more adventurous. In fact, what we did was to use basel i borwein type steps. And I pointed out earlier that this is a non-monotone method that sometimes takes long steps. It sometimes causes the function to really blow up. But in the long run, it's often better. OK. <coughs> um, OK. So we, um, we do actually safeguard the bars like ball, and We sort of apply some uh, restrictions to it so that occasionally, you know, over a span of, say, 10 iterations, we at least want to get a reduction. Uh, we at least want to be better now than we were 10 iterations ago. So occasionally we'll do backtracking to force us to, um, to uh, in the long run, get better. So we don't just go all out basel i borwein There's a little bit of safeguarding going on. But essentially the ideas are from basel i borwein OK. And for that case, we can prove convergence to, to critical points. And we get uh, significantly better uh, practical performance, often better than, than FISTA even. OK, this I'll skip over. This was actually our first idea. Maybe I'll mention it. Our first idea when we looked at this problem, which is the one that shows up in compressed sensing, is to actually split the variable x into positive and negative parts. So we just express x as u minus v, where u and v are both positive. And if you do that splitting, you can write the one norm of x just as the sum of the elements of u and v. Man, there are typos all over the place here. That should be a v, OK? So this is, this, this is just the sum of the elements of u. That's the sum of the elements of v. OK, so that captures the one norm. And this, of course, is the first term. And so, <clears throat> and so this is just now a quadratic program with bound constraints. And there are nice, efficient solvers available for that. Uh, projected gradient type solvers work on that. So that was our first approach until we figured out that you really didn't need to do the splitting. You could just treat it directly using this uh, shrinking type, uh, this prox operator. OK, but then we got two papers out of it instead of one. So I guess you can't argue with that. <laughs> OK, so here are some. Our colleague Dirk Lorenz um, wrote this paper where he, he developed, a, I think, a reasonable way of generating test problems for these cases that have something to do with compressed sensing. So um, you know they involve the sorts of matrices that show up in, uh, in, in observation matrices. And he ran tests between a bunch of different algorithms. And I've mentioned IST, GPS, R, Sparser, and FISTA. I've actually covered a bunch of these. These are sort of alternative acceleration. This is a different kind of acceleration due to Candes and, um, uh, and uh, some of his collaborators. Uh, this is actually is an augmented, augmented Lagrangian approach, which I'll talk about uh, presently. And this was an earlier approach, um, which I won't mention. But he sort of generated results, and they're color-coded. I'm not sure if you can see the colors too well. But in this one, Sparser actually did quite well. And Nesta, which is an accelerate, Nesta of acceleration type one, um, uh, sort of did quite similarly to, to Sparser in that example. They did better than FISTA, even though FISTA has acceleration. But here's an example where, well, here's another example where Sparser does well. OK, I guess Mario picked the ones where we do, uh, we do well here. But here's an example where Sparser really exhibits that non-monotonicity, okay? 
This was one where all the solvers kind of struggle. The A here is coherent. It, in other words, it doesn't satisfy that, those rip properties that, uh, that classical uh, compressive, compressed sensing analysis depends on. Uh, and so it, when, when that property is not satisfied, these solvers can be very slow. And they're all quite slow here. And you'll see that Pfister, although you know, at its best, is not too bad. Oh, sorry, this is uh, sparser. You really see the, the Barzillai Bourne type <laughs> behavior where in between it spikes and goes crazy. These other methods are much more kind of mon monotonic. And Pfister here does generally better than the others. OK. okay you yes. Right, yes, you can always evaluate functions in. Uh, uh, you can always evaluate the function. So you can always tell when this is happening. But you kind of, you ignore it for a while. Uh, it's only if it sort of consistently stays high that you start backtracking to make sure you get back to the baseline here. Because in general, if you don't allow it to do this, you get kind of a slower overall rate. So even though this looks bad, it's kind of setting you up to make better advances down the road. So I think here, IST, I'm not sure. I think IST is this one. So IST is really sparser with the less aggressive step length. So you can see that overall its behavior is worse, right? So by bouncing around here, you do do a little bit better. Not terribly intuitive, but anyway. OK, so this is another trick that's very important um, in these methods, and that's the idea of continuation. So this regularization parameter tau turns out to really affect the performance. So remember, tau is the coefficient that goes with the uh, with the x1 term. OK, so um, let's see. So when tau is small, uh, these things can be pretty slow, OK, a lot slower. Tau is bigger means that it really is penalizing the non-zero x's more viciously. And that tends to drive a lot of the x's to zero more quickly. And those problems seem, uh, tend to be easier to solve. And so you can design a very simple strategy where you know, you know the value of tau that you want to apply. But you start it with some value that's much bigger than that. And you solve the problem for that big value of tau. You run these algorithms for a while. Um, you stop when they find an approximate solution for that value of tau. Then you decrease tau by a bit and repeat the process, starting from the solution that you found here. So it's sort of an obvious idea, continuation idea, where you gradually work from an easy problem to the hard problem in little baby steps, Okay, sort of starting from the warm starting each time from the uh, solution of the previous step. So the parameter here to choose is how much you de de decrease tau by. You can be adaptive about that. You can you know, start off decreasing tau aggressively. If you find out you're taking too many iterations to solve this problem, you can back off and decrease it kind of less aggressively. So you know, there are pretty, uh, pretty good ways of figuring out how to do this. And there's some analysis of this. Um, in this paper by Zhao and Zhang, they sort of show the overall complexity of this approach. OK, so when you do continuation with these methods, um, you tend to, uh, gee, I have to remember what this thing is showing. Uh, you tend to get sort of more gentle uh, increases. So as we move out along here, tau is getting smaller. So the ratio of the maximum value of tau to the value that we actually try is getting bigger. OK. And this is how the C CPU time goes up. So this is if you don't use continuation, the CPU time increases sharply as tau decreases. But if you use this continuation idea and sort of gradually ramp up to the, uh, ramp down to the value of tau that you're looking for, you get much gentler behavior. OK. So um, all right, debiasing. I don't, debiasing is kind of the, the obvious idea that when you think you've identified the support of x, when you think you've figured out which components of x want to be non-zero, you just toss out the zero components and solve the reduce problem and drop the uh, L1 term. OK, so you, you, just, you just use the regularizer to pick the support. And once you find the support, you just solve a least squares problem just over the, thing, the support that you've identified. And we usually do that as a kind of a post-processing step in Sparser. Uh, because if you leave the regularizer in there, it tends to suppress the values um, of x, the real values of x. It tends to push them down a little bit. So this is a bit ad hoc. Um, you know, there are other regularizers that statisticians are interested in that, uh, that, that don't 
uh, introduce this bias into the solution, the so-called SCAD and MCP regularizers, where, um, man, I keep losing the chalk. Uh, yeah, where, you know, the L1 regularizer basically does this. Okay, it penalizes like that. But the statisticians are interested in these other regularizers where as you move away from the origin, it flattens out. And so when you're out in this region, it doesn't penalize you too much for being non-zero. Whereas here, the penalty keeps going up the, further, the bigger you get. And they can show that um, regularizers like this give unbiased solutions. So you wouldn't have to do these... Um, you wouldn't have to do these post-processing steps. But what's the disadvantage of this? What's the disadvantage of using this as opposed to this? Any ideas? Yeah? It's not convex, yeah. That's kind of the killer about this. So you have a non-convex problem to solve. It's, you know, convex, uh, algorithms like the ones we talked about still work pretty well on these problems, but you lose a lot of the convergence guarantees. Okay because you've got a non-convex problem. So I've often had this um, discussion with statisticians of why don't, you, why don't you do it this way? Why don't you use L1, solve a convex problem, find the support and then debias, as opposed to just doing it one step like this. And uh, their argument is that this is actually better at finding the support. If you do this up front and you are able to solve it, which is a big caveat, that it actually does a better job at finding the right support than, than the L1 does, okay? And I have to trust them on that, right? Because they're the experts on this kind of thing. All right, so this is just to illustrate the effect of debiasing. Here's a problem where we've got n equals 4096. Here's the true solution. Notice all of the spikes have a norm have size one, plus or minus one. Um, if you do sparser on this and solve it, you get a solution that's obviously biased a lot of the magnitudes of the spikes have been suppressed. But then if you take the, the support, the non-zeros here, and solve that debiased problem, throw out the L1 regularizer, you recover the, um, the, you basically recover most of the unit magnitudes. Okay. The reason they're not exactly the same is that some of the, um, uh, the support's not exactly right. Okay. If the support was exactly right, um, I'm not sure if we have noise in this problem. Yeah, I think we do have a little bit of noise. The noise would be another reason why, um, why it wouldn't be exact. Okay, uh, I think I'll skip the rest of this. Yeah, we'll skip the rest of this deck. So let me go on to the, the augmented Lagrangian one. Okay, which is this one. Okay, so this whole ADMM has uh, spawned a whole cottage industry in the optimization community, mostly because um, it's turned out to be quite useful in a lot of these uh, image uh, reconstruction, signal reconstruction applications. So the second half of this deck actually has uh, a lot of stuff about the work of Mario and his collaborators on, um, on those kinds of applications. And I probably won't get that far. So let's see, I've got to finish at 10 to 6, and if I go, off, go over time, people will kill me because I'm getting into dinner time. And I've got to remember to have a break, right, at uh, quarter past, in about 10 minutes. Okay? All right. So I'll probably get through about half of this deck, maybe a little bit more. All right. So I just want to give you the basic idea of augmented Lagrangian and, uh, and its extension to ADMM. All right? So <coughs> I'll start by considering this linearly constrained problem. Uh, where I've got a smooth function f and a bunch of linear constraints. So first of all, how do we recognize that an x star is a solution of this problem? Well, we can write down these magical things called karush kuhn tucker conditions that guarantee that you, or at least if x star really is a solution, these KKT conditions have to hold. In other words, they're necessary conditions for a solution. And they say the following, that if, um, if there exists a lambda star, so that you can express the gradient of f at x star as a linear combination of the rows of A, where the coefficients of that combination are the elements of lambda star. <coughs> and of course, you also need x star to be feasible. It has to satisfy the constraints. <coughs> so if those conditions are true, then that's kind of an indication that you're, you're at a solution. If f is convex, these are also sufficient conditions. Okay. <coughs> 
So if f is convex, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for an x star and a lambda star that satisfy these conditions. Okay. All right, so a neat way to write those conditions is to write down this so-called Lagrangian function. And it's a way of combining the objective and the constraints. So you write down f of x, and then you add on this term lambda transpose the uh, constraints, ax minus b. And ax minus b has to be 0 at the solution, of course. Okay. And so those KKT conditions, you can write them down by, first of all, taking the partial derivative of this expression with respect to x. And then you just get grad f plus a transpose lambda. Okay. And that has to be equal to 0. So that gives me exactly what I had here. All right. So that's the first KKT condition. And the second KKT condition is when I differentiate <coughs> with respect to lambda, I just get ax minus b equals 0. And that's the second condition here. Okay. So this is a neat way of writing the KKT conditions, just that we're at a stationary point of this function. A stationary point is one where the gradient is 0. Okay. So if f is convex but non-smooth, all of these ideas are the same. Uh, we can just replace the gradient with a, a generalizer with a subgradient, and then grad f just becomes subgradient of f, subdifferential. Okay, and I skipped over all the stuff about subdifferentials, but <coughs> but it's a you know it's a, the obvious extension of uh, the derivative to the case where f is convex. Okay, but I won't say too much more about this. All right, so what is an augmented Lagrangian method? So the idea is you write down the Lagrangian function and you add on this extra term. It's kind of a penalty term for the constraints. And it's just some multiple times the 2 norm of ax minus b squared. Now obviously, at the solution, this is going to be 0. So this is penalizing you. It's sort of forcing you to be feasible. Okay. So you define that function. It's just an extension of Lagrangian. And then this is the basic iteration for augmented Lagrangian. First of all, you fix the lambda at its value from the previous iterate, lambda k minus 1. And you minimize with respect to x. Okay, So you just get a, a subproblem. If you look at it, look at what it's doing just with respect to x. It's the original f plus um, a linear term in x, because the lambda is fixed. So it's just going to be x transpose a transpose lambda. So it's a linear term. And then there's going to be a quadratic term coming in here. So, you know, it might be a little bit harder. It might be a lot harder than the original problem, depending on how hard it is to solve to minimize f. Could be easier, could be the same. It's usually not easier, but it could be the same or a bit harder. Okay? And then, um, and then you update lambda according to this formula. All right? <coughs> this seems a little bit magic, but I'm going to show you a simple derivation that sort of makes this all make sense. Okay? So you change lambda according to this simple formula. This is usually easy to do. And then you solve these minimizations. So the idea is you're replacing um, the solution of a constrained problem with a solution of a sequence of unconstrained problems alternating with some updates, which are usually cheap. Okay? All right. All right. So here's a derivation that's kind of a favorite of mine. And it's kind of rigorous. I think you can, um, you can show that all the steps I'm going to describe here actually uh, can be rigorously justified in the case where f is convex. OK, so first of all, I'm going to take the original problem. And I'm going to write it in a really bizarre form. I'm going to say, um, instead of minimizing f of x subject to ax equals b, I'm going to say that I want to minimize this function here. This function that is defined as being the maximum over lambda of f of x plus lambda transpose ax minus b. Now, that's a really bizarre function and kind of an ugly function. But you can see that if ax is not equal to b, some elements of this vector are going to be non-zero. And then when I maximize over lambda, I'm going to be able to drive this term to infinity. Okay? If any of these are either positive or negative, I can pick the corresponding component of lambda to go to infinity in one direction or another and drive this whole term <coughs> and drive this whole term to infinity. Okay? And so you can see that this function here it's going to be infinite if ax is not equal to b. If ax is equal to b, this whole function is just going to be equal to f of x. So this is totally equivalent 
to this original problem. Okay? But of course, it's not useful from an optimization viewpoint because this function in here is a horrible function. It's discontinuous. Sometimes it's finite. Sometimes it's equal to f. But then if you move off this manifold, it suddenly jumps to infinity. So it's not something we can apply any kind of reasonable algorithm to. But we can sort of stabilize it. Okay, So what we can do is to add on or subtract a quadratic term from this. So here's the original maximization, but I'm just going to subtract this quadratic term. So I'm going to pick some sort of anchor point, lambda bar, and I'm going to penalize any move away from lambda bar. And I'll parameterize it with some positive quantity here. OK, so what's happened now is that this function that I'm maximizing lambda over is now a concave quadratic. It's got this shape, upside down convex, strictly concave quadratic. And so for any x, feasible or infeasible, I can actually write down in closed form what the maximizing lambda of this thing is. Okay? In fact, it's a very simple quadratic because the Hessian is just the identity or multiple of the identity. So I can write down a closed form solution of this guy. Uh, here it is here. Okay, it's just lambda bar plus rho times ax minus b. Okay? So actually calculating in closed form what this whole maximization thing is doing is now has now become easy. So now what I can do is to plug this optimized lambda back into this function and then I've evaluated the thing in the curly brackets here. Okay? I've actually got a value of that and this is what it is. This is all it becomes. When I plug that in, I just get that. Okay? And that's exactly the augmented Lagrangian function where the anchor point is just the lambda from the previous iteration. Okay? So basically what I've got is I go from the exact formulation, exact but ugly formulation of the original problem, I stabilize it by introducing this prox term, explicitly maximize, and I get back uh, exactly the function that we minimize in the augmented Lagrangian step. So now you can see that you can view the whole augmented Lagrangian process as plugging in lambda k minus 1 here, minimizing this guy to get the new x, then shifting lambda bar to be the updated point. In other words, you do this maximization to get your next iterate, your next estimate of lambda. So you update lambda according to that formula. And that's exactly the formula that I had here. Okay, so I update lambda. I use that as the new anchor point for the next iteration uh, and then just repeat the whole process. Okay? So you can think of augmented Lagrangian as a stabilized version of uh, sort of dual ascent, a dual ascent kind of approach. Okay. You can do other things. You can mess around with the lambda here, uh, with the rho, which is a penalty term. Most augmented Lagrangian methods have heuristics for deciding when they need to increase the rho if, the, if these constraints are not becoming feasible fast enough, they decide to sort of increase the rho to make the penalty uh, more uh, acute. <coughs> they might have a different rho for each, each constraint, things like that. There are lots of heuristics there. But you don't particularly need to do very much with the rho. Um, another way to motivate augmented Lagrangian, by the way, is as an extension of the old-fashioned quadratic penalty function. And this was invented by Courant in the 1940s. The quadratic penalty function is just the same as this where there's no lambda term, where you just take the original objective and add on a quadratic penalty for the constraints. The problem with quadratic penalty is that you have to make the, the row go to infinity to get convergence to a feasible point. You have to drive that to infinity. The advantage of augmented Lagrangian is you don't have to do that. You can actually get convergence to the exact solution even for finite values of rho, which is a pretty big advantage. Okay. All right. Uh, right. Uh, so, so how do we extend this? This is a very special case, equality constraints. Okay. We can extend it to inequality constraints using exactly the same rationale. So I can write it down as a min-max function. But when I'm dealing with inequality constraints, now I have to maximize over lambda greater than or equal to zero. Okay, because if uh, I need to only pay attention to the cases where these constraints are violated, that's where the AX is less than B. One of the rows of AX is less than the corresponding element of B. And then I can drive this function to infinity. Okay, if this constraint is not satisfied, I can drive this to infinity. 
So again, this is not practical because it's um, equal to f when this thing is um, feasible, but infinity otherwise. I can stabilize it in the same way, add on that prox term, uh, do an explicit <coughs> minimization with respect to phi. Now this is the explicit minimum. I can plug that back in and I get an inequality con constrained form of the augmented Lagrangian. And it all goes through. The formula, by the way, for inequality constraints looks really very non-intuitive. But that's all it is. It can be motivated in exactly the same way. Here's another extension. Sometimes you've got constraints that are, this, ha this happens a lot actually. You've got some constraints that are easy to deal with explicitly and others that you need to kind of penalize in the Lagrangian approach. And so you can deal with those just by putting these into the augmented Lagrangian and dealing with these explicitly in the minimization step. So these might be, for example, bounds. You might have x greater than or equal to zero here. Or there might be box constraints where x has to be in a range between lower and upper bound. <coughs> <coughs> and sometimes it's easy to deal with them here. And everything else about this is the same. You just need to minimize over the, the constraints at omega. Everything else works. And in fact, you can use that observation that you can deal with some of the constraints explicitly by, it'll give you another way to deal with cases where you've got inequalities. Because you can just replace inequalities by slacks, okay? When you've, when you've got a constraint C of X greater than or equal to zero, where C is some vector function, you can replace that with C of X equal to S, then S is greater than or equal to zero. So now you've got an, uh, an optimization problem involving X and S. I need to have a comma S here because I'm minimizing over X and S. And you can deal with this exactly using this methodology where I put this constraint into the Lagrangian and I deal with this one explicitly. And that gives you an alternative way of, uh, of applying augmented Lagrangian to um, functions with inequality constraints. The only thing here is when you're solving the subproblem, you have to remember that you need to keep the S's greater than or equal to zero. So the codes that, um, there is a general code that came out over 20 years ago now, 25 years ago, Lancelot, where they essentially used this way of solving general nonlinear programs um, with, um, with inequality constraints. Okay. All right, so a bit of history of augmented Lagrangian. It's had a very rocky history, I would say. It was first invented simultaneously and independently by these two researchers in 1969, Estenes and Powell. Powell died recently, and we had a meeting to celebrate him last week in Mexico, actually. Um, but this is one of a number of things that he was famous for. Um, then these uh, very famous figures, Rockefeller and Bert Sekis, worked on it in the uh, 1970s and more in the early 1980s and extended it to nonlinear constraints, uh, to inequalities and all this kind of thing and uh, developed uh, generalized to um, operators rather than, uh, mini rather than just optimization. Did a lot of work on it. And then it sort of fell out of favor for quite a while maybe 10 years or so. And then these guys, Congul and Twant, started working in the late 80s, trying to, started really trying to get it to work. <coughs> and as a culmination of about four or five years of work, they came out with this code, Lancelot, that won prizes and seemed to be quite competitive. And then something revolutionary happened in uh, the years, you know, probably mid to late 90s, particularly in the late 90s in nonlinear programming algorithms. Does anyone know what that was? So the new technology came along that kind of blew these out of the water to some extent. Interior point methods, yeah. So interior point methods were developed for linear programming and uh, computationally they matured in the early 90s and then in the late 90s they became uh, one of the dominant technologies in uh, nonlinear programming as well. And um, it turned out that they beat Lancelot and SQP, sequential quadratic programming, on a lot of problems. Not uniformly, but, uh, <coughs> but they seem to, on kind of the general test sets that nonlinear programming people use, uh, uh, interior points started to dominate. Yeah. yeah. No, they're actually easier to code in many ways. Basic versions of them are quite easy to code. Um, because the core operations are just solving linear systems, you know, that's pretty straightforward. 
even for linear programming, they're extraordinary because you can write, uh, you know, I've got a MATLAB code that's a page and a half long that's actually quite competitive in so for linear programming as a general purpose solver, interior point solver. Whereas simplex codes are incredibly sophisticated. Simplex codes for linear programming run to, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines to get all the factorizations efficient and everything. Um, so interior point codes are remarkably easy to code. Uh, these, these are, SQP codes are demanding because you have to solve a quadratic program at every iteration and to do that properly is, is hard. Um, and Lancelot is pretty complicated because you have to solve this nonlinear bound constraint problem. And they do that using a variety of quasi-Newton type methods. So anyway, this kind of fell out of favor and the whole the whole augmented Lagrangian idea sort of dropped dropped out of favor until uh, you know until uh, order of five to s five or six years ago. Okay. Yep. So um, the, the, the function f. Yeah. What do you ask about that? Uh, well, right now I've been asking that it's uh, smooth and you know convex if you want strong convergence results, but it actually does work for non-smooth <laughs> f's as well. Yeah, if you. Yeah, uh, then the theory probably gets a bit more shaky, but you can still try. There's no harm in trying. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm not going to say much about that. Oh, break, sorry, yeah. Oh, God, I always go over time. Okay. So after the break, I've got about 20, 20 something minutes left. Okay. Sorry about that. I have uh, 20 minutes to finish up. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I just wanted to make this comment that, uh, that so these methods, uh, they fell out of favor for a long time. But, but now um, in the last five to seven or so years, they've been revived in the context of sparse optimization, regularized type optimization, as we'll see, okay? In conjunction with splitting. So splitting has turned out to be an important way of making these work for those applications. So let me describe what this, um, this whole splitting idea is about. And I'll def define it first in these very basic terms where we just split uh, the variables into two blocks. So let's suppose that I've got that linearly constrained problem that I talked about earlier, but let's suppose that I can break the variables into two vectors, x and z, and each of them has a separate objective, okay? So this is a slightly more specialized form than I had originally, okay? So I can write down the augmented Lagrangian for this problem in exactly the same way. I've got the objective here. I've got lambda times the constraint here. I've got rho over two times the norm of the constraint here, okay? So I could just apply augmented Lagrangian to this. And augmented Lagrangian would have two steps. In the first step, you fix lambda and minimize jointly over x and z, okay? And the second step, you update lambda. That's all it is. Uh, so that's what you would do in standard augmented Lagrangian. The separability is lost. You can see when you jointly minimize over x and z, in, this t in these terms, the x and z are decoupled. You can solve them independently. In this term, they're decoupled. Again, there's no cross term involving both x and z, but here they're coupled, okay? If you multiply out this term here, it's got a term that say, says x transpose, a transpose, b times z. So there's a coupling between the x's and the z's. So when you minimize with respect to x and z jointly, you have to take care of that coupling. And so you don't get any advantage of the fact that, you know, they're almost separate here. So in ADMM, or alternating direction method of multipliers, what you do is just minimize with respect to x and z separately. So instead of a joint minimization over x and z, first you fix z as well as lambda, okay, and just minimize with respect to x. And then you do the opposite. Then you leave the lambda fixed, and you fix x at, the, at its latest value that you just calculated, and then you minimize with respect to z. <coughs> Okay, so, <coughs> so these two steps replace the joint minimization. 
and then you update the lambda. So you can see this is kind of an, an approximate way of doing the joint minimization. Okay, it's kind of an approximate way where you you take a step in the x direction and in the z direction. So you're alternating between between x and z steps essentially. But you're also updating the lambda in between. Okay, so you can think of it, and there's some controversy about how you should think about what's going on here. One way to think about it is this is like coordinate descent, block coordinate descent. Coordinate descent is a classic algorithm where you break the components of x into blocks, and and at each iteration you pick one block and you just minimize over that block of components, leave all the others fixed. So you can think of this as one step of coordinate descent over the for the minimization over x and z jointly. Fixing x, uh, fixing z, minimizing over x, fixing x, minimizing over z. You could keep cycling around here. You could keep the lambda fixed at this value, and you could keep updating x and z. But it turns out not to be very, very beneficial. There's a paper by Eckstein from a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, where he shows that <coughs> if you actually make a serious attempt to minimize over x and z jointly, you don't do much better than if you do this approach of doing this very approximate minimization. So that's one way to think about it. Uh, what about the cost of these things? Well, uh, basically when you do these, these minimization steps, when you minimize over the x, the z is fixed, and so the h term is not going to come into it. Okay, that's just a constant as far as this guy is concerned. This is a constant, this is a constant. Uh, so what you've got is a minimization over f plus a linear term plus a quadratic term in x. And this quadratic term is going to have a Hessian a transpose a. Okay? Now again, that might be same difficulty as the original minimization over f, or it might be harder. Okay? Depends on the context. Same thing here for the minimization over z. Then the x term is basically constant because you're fixing it. You just got the original h plus a, a linear term involving z plus a quadratic term with b transpose b in it. Okay, so that's the cost. It's like a sequence of minimizations over f and h with this quadratic term added on. You can also deal with the case where you've got some explicit separated constraints. So if you've got some additional constraints on x and z, that are separated. If you want x to belong to some set omega x and z to belong to some set omega z, you can go here and just apply those constraints explicitly in these minimizations. So that generalizes the class of problems that you can deal with. And uh, as we'll see, because we have a little bit of extra time, there are many applications of this to compressed sensing, image processing, matrix completion, sparse PCA, and so on. Okay. So this idea of ADMM the way that it's written here, it's derived from augmented Lagrangian, but its history actually goes back further. You can, you can treat it as an operator splitting type method. And the antecedents for that go back to the 1950s. And so there are papers in the operator splitting literature going way back uh, that basically have the same sort of idea of breaking uh, operators into two pieces. And there's this recent paper by Boyd. He really caught the wave here. Uh, Boyd and Eckstein and two other people wrote this survey paper in 2011. And um, I checked the citation count on that last week. It's already 2,800 citations. So it turned out to be a great idea to write a survey paper right when they did. OK. Now I'll give you some uh, applications of this idea just to show how it is very useful. And this, this splitting ADMM idea is very useful for a lot of kind of interesting, familiar problems. So suppose here you have a problem, uh, like you get in machine learning and many other applications, where the objective function is a, it's a sum of a bunch of objective functions, but they all depend on the same variable x. Okay? Now this does not look like the sort of problem that I've been writing down on the previous slides. It's an unconstrained problem. So what's, how do I apply augmented Lagrangian or ADMM to this? Well, I can reformulate it like this instead. I can say, let me, let me introduce a, a copy of this variable x that's different for every objective, every objective in the sum. So I'll bring in a separate variable xi, such that fi is just a function of xi. And then I'll have this constraint that all of the xi's have to be equal to x. Okay? So you can think of x as being kind of the master variable, 
And you want all of these sort of copies to be equal to x, ultimately. All right? So it's obvious, I'm sure it's obvious to everyone, that, if I, uh, that this formulation and this are going to have basically the same problem. They're going to have the same answer. Okay. But this problem is in a form that I can apply ADMM. And what I'll do is apply ADMM where, where I had x in the ADMM um, expression in the last few slides, I'll replace that with x. And where I had z in the last few slides, I'll replace that with all the copies, x1 through xm. So this is going to be the z block. Okay. So I can write down what does the augmented Lagrangian look like. Well, it's just the original objective. Here it is here, plus lambda transpose the constraints. Well, now there's a whole bunch of constraints. So I've got a lambda i for each of these individual constraints. So that's the lambda transpose constraint term. And then I've got um, <coughs> this penalty term for each of these constraints as well, xi minus x2 norm squared. OK, so this is my augmented Lagrangian term. <coughs> to stochastic optimization. This is not, OK? It looks similar because the objective is exactly the form that stochastic optimization uses. But uh, what I'm describing here is not going to be a stochastic optimization method. OK, then you'd have to do. Yeah. It's a different, it's a different algorithm because it's actually treating f. It's dealing with the whole f at every iteration, whereas stochastic optimization doesn't do that. A stochastic optimization, you typically pick one of these FIs and you do something based on that. I have a whole other slide deck for that, but since Francis is going to talk more about that tomorrow, I'm going to leave it up to him. Okay. Besides which, I've only got 10 minutes. So. <laughs> All right. So that's a topic for another day. Okay. Uh, but certainly, this is the kind of thing that you'd also be interested in using stochastic optimization for. Okay. So what are the steps to implement ADMM on this? What are the two things you have to do? Well, the first thing is you have to uh, minimize this over x, the master variable x. That's one step. And if you look at this function as a function of x, it's actually a very simple function because there's no x anywhere in here. Okay? This, fun this function here only has the copies. It only has the z in it. In fact, all we've got going on in x is this quadratic. And we can explicitly minimize this guy with respect to x. And here it is. Here's the solution. This is what I get when I, when I minimize the augmented Lagrangian with respect to x. I can write down explicitly what the answer is. So that part is really easy. Okay. Now what's the other step in, um, in ADMM? It's minimizing with respect to z. To minimize with respect to z, I have to minimize this over all of the xi's. Now if you look at that, it's got a special property with respect to the xi's. Can, can you tell me what it is? Well, I've written it down here, given you the answer. <laughs> it's separable, OK? I should, use the, uh, I should have used the uh, strip tease uh, thing where I obscure the, the last part of the slide. Anyway, it's separable. So that's the big advantage here, is that when you minimize over z, it decomposes into m separate problems, OK? You can minimize with respect to each of the xi's separately. OK, so you can just pick out the xi term from here, uh, pick out the xi term here, pick out the xi term here. And in parallel, simultaneously, whatever, I can solve this problem for each xi. OK, so it gives me a very natural way to parallelize an algorithm for, this, for solving this problem. So all in all, uh, ADMM for this problem, I, I, I've got a step here, which is probably the expensive part of it but one that I can decompose and solve in parallel. I've got this step, which I have to perform on some sort of master processor. I have to gather in the results of all the minimizations for the xi's and then sum them all up and um, do something with the lambda i's. And then I have to update the lambdas. And again, I can do that by in parallel. This, this can be done in parallel as well. So the advantage of using ADMM to solve this problem is that most of the computation can actually be parallelized, OK? <clears throat> Whereas it's not obvious just looking at this how to parallelize it. I, guess it. I guess one obvious way to parallelize it is you can just evaluate all the gradients of this and, and do those in parallel of all, the, all of all the FIs simultaneously. So I guess there is another way to do it. OK. So here's another important way when you're dealing with matrix optimization problems. 
Sometimes in these problems, you've got a feasible set that's the intersection of two sets. Question? Yeah. Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, if we go back to this, let's go back to the general form. If one of F or H is, a, um, is an L1, for example, then the corresponding step here just becomes a self-thresholding step. So if you think of this as being L1, then you've just got, uh, when you do this minimization here, you've just got L1 plus a quadratic term involving Z. And that just, that just becomes a self-thresholding step. So it becomes quite simple to solve. At least if, if B is the identity, it becomes self-thresholding. If B is a general matrix, it becomes a quadratic plus an L1. And again, you can solve that using uh, sparser or some algorithm like that. So again, it becomes relatively easy. Yeah. Often, yeah. Often it's competitive, yeah. Often it's, it really depends a lot on the context, but it, it's, um, it's often um, competitive with interior point or better than interior point, for sure. You mentioned it's getting larger and larger what happens. Yeah. Again, it's very context dependent and it's very dependent on how easy these subproblems are to solve. Um, interior point can't really deal with non-smoothness here, whereas we've just mentioned that if H is an L1, then you know, this is good, you can still do this. Interior point, it's not so obvious how to deal with that. You'd have to reparameterize it to make it smooth, for instance. So there are factors like that that you have to take into account. Uh, yeah. This one? Yep. Yeah, if, if these are L1, uh, yeah, so if some of these are L1, then this, so, some of these would be thresholding type operations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you've got a regularized least squares problem, then you could think of that as being M equals 2, and F1 would be the least squares part, and F2 would be the regularized part. Okay, and then actually that's kind of what YAWL is. That's one of the methods that I plotted earlier. It sort of does that. It basically does what you said. So it solves these, it solves these sub problems where it, uh, it updates the, uh, you know, it has the two copies in it. And one of the steps is kind of a thresholding step. Yeah, it, the advantage is actually not so clear. Yule is sometimes competitive, but it really depends. One of the subproblems is still kind of hard to solve um, because you still have a least squares in, in one of these guys. And so um, to solve that subproblem, you sort of have to invert an A transpose A plus some multiple of the identity. And in Yule, Yule 1, they do that approximately. They have an approximate way of doing that. And they have to bring in heuristics to make it competitive. But <laughs> you could, but then you'd have to settle for an approximate solution because you wouldn't be minimizing exactly over the XI. You'd, ha you'd, you'd have an iterative method where you'd be iterating towards a solution. And that actually brings up a point. Um, the idea of inexact implementations of ADMM, um, there wasn't much theory about those until recently because obviously in practice you want to be able to get away with inexact solutions here. Um, and it's only been in the last couple of years that people have started coming up with convergence theories for inexact methods. In fact, I wasted a chunk of my summer working on inexact convergence theory only to find that someone else had done it already. So. I've got a real grudge against these methods. Uh, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. I, w I do want to say something about this in the last five minutes. Um, this is a very popular problem where you've got two constraint sets that individually are not very hard to deal with, but their intersection is difficult to deal with. So these constraints, this is a matrix optimization problem. 
where one constraint says I want the matrix to be positive semi-definite, that's what that is saying. X here is I'm taking to be a square matrix, okay? A square, actually a square, um, symmetric square matrix, okay? Uh, and this constraint is saying that I want all the elements of X to be individually non-negative, okay? So these are two different constraints. And it turns out you can project onto this set by itself pretty efficiently by taking a singular value decomposition or an eigenvalue decomposition and just throwing away the negative eigenvalues, just setting them to zero. So it's easy to project onto this set, and it's easy to project onto this set. You just take the negative elements of x and set them to zero. So they're easy to deal with. But dealing with their intersection is much harder, okay? So how can you solve this kind of problem using ADMM? Well, here's a general form. Let me write this down in general form. I just want x to belong to a bunch of different constraint sets, omega i, and I'm assuming that I can project onto each omega i efficiently, but dealing with the intersection is hard. So I sort of come up with the same idea as on the previous example. I make copies of x. I make up one copy of x for each constraint set. Let's call it xi. And then I add these constraints that say that all of the xi's have to equal x in the limit, okay, for all, for all i going from 1 up to m. So I write the problem like this. And then I do ADMM. And I do it in the same way as I did on the previous slide. Okay? So I, um, well, almost the same way. Uh, the difference is that when I write down the augmented Lagrangian for this, the uh, first term has an f of x in it. It doesn't have any terms involving the xi's. The xi's only come into the constraints. Okay? But it looks like I've skipped the details here. Um, but now in this case, the, the part that's easy is the minimization over the xi's. Because to minimize over the xi's, I just have to minimize a quadratic with actually with an identity Hessian here. But I have to project back onto the set, the constraint set for that, for the, the ith constraint set. Okay. So this usually is easy, depending on how difficult it is to deal with this constraint set. Okay. And then to minimize over the, the x, which is the other step in ADMM, I no longer have any constraints. All the constraint sets are gone. I just have the original objective plus some quadratic terms. Okay? So uh, this is how we deal with uh, intersection of awkward constraints. And then you update the multipliers like this. So this turns out to be a pretty good method for solving problems like that. Okay? So on uh, uh, one step of augmented Lagrangian, you're minimizing over these two sets separately. And then you're kind of doing this uh, amalgamation where you bring them together. Okay, so this is pretty much where I have to stop. The, the, the other half of this deck, which I'll uh, leave for your uh, viewing pleasure, basically uh, is considering a slightly more general form. In fact, it's a slightly more specialized form of the form we've been discussing, where the B matrix is the identity. And it turns out that a lot of applications in image processing look like this. They have this kind of a form. And so um, some of the papers that have been written um, actually uh, deal with a special form. I'll just point to this slide here where the first kind of, one of the foundational papers of ADMM is this paper that came out of Eckstein's thesis. He wrote the thesis in 89. The paper appeared in 92. And if you look at the citation record for this, it's really interesting because it was around for a while. You know, people knew about this paper for a long time, it got you know a steady number of few citations a year, and then suddenly in 2008, the citation count started to blow up because people started to find that this was incredibly useful in a lot of these applications coming from uh, signal reconstruction, image reconstruction. So it's starting to plateau again now, but uh, it really went crazy for a while. And as I mentioned, this Boyd paper has 2,800 citations. So I'll let you look at this. Mario added a lot of slides here with. Um, different kinds of uh, image processing problems showing how augmented Lagrangian can be applied and how it's more efficient than competing methods. Then I have a slide at the end about, remember I mentioned that I think in the first session this morning, I mentioned this problem of recovering the uh, uh, sparse inverse covariance matrix. And you can do that also using ADMM. And I've got a couple of slides demonstrating how to do that. But I'll leave them for your uh, viewing enjoyment. Thank you very much. I made it. Thank <laughs> you.
voll. This is not my approach on this problem. But certainly there are other ways to solve this problem. And uh, I don't really know how they compare. Uh, so certainly that what you mentioned could be competitive on some regime, for sure. Yeah, there are other ways to deal with this. Um, in fact, I think when I solved it, I, I did solve it as an SDP. I had a problem like this that showed up in some context that where I did use an SDP solver. Yeah. So all of these things are very context dependent. That's why you'll see comparisons on a set of test problems between vastly different approaches. And sometimes one of them has an advantage, sometimes the other one does. So you know what we've got here is a toolbox of a bunch of different kinds of methods. I've only mentioned a few today. Um, and uh, that's what modern optimization is like in these applications. There's no one best method that fits all. Instead, you've got this toolbox of different techniques, and you sort of have to dig in the toolbox and combine different methods, maybe take elements of different methods and you know, join them together in weird ways, use some imaginative uh, merging and use some, a lot of domain knowledge. Domain knowledge is incredibly important, making these things work. And eventually, you get some method that works well. That's, what, that's how things work these days. Uh, yeah, often it's just uh, some kind of, uh, I'm trying to think because I don't know these problems all that well. Often it's just a nearness thing. So you're trying to find the nearest matrix to, it could be just x minus y for being is norm squared, for example. So you're given a matrix y and you're just trying to find the matrix closest to y that's doubly non-negative. You know, that might be one example. Um, that's probably the simplest example. I'm sure there are others that I'm not thinking of right now. So the rule of thumb is the rule that doesn't call on this method to be used anymore. Not really. No, I can't. Actually, I've been asked this question a lot, but there's no recipe book anymore, really. Um, you just have to, you have to come to tutorials like this and, and uh, you know, the other talks included and learn enough about the recipe so that when you're presented with a problem, you kind of recognize some distinctive features for which certain approaches are kind of useful and then try a bunch of things out. So um, no, there's not a, it'd be nice if I could draw, draw a flow chart, you know, with a, like those old uh, design diagrams that they used to have in the 60s where you ask these questions, you know, is F non-convex? Yes, no, you know, go in these different directions. Is F quadratic? Yes, no. If quadratic, is it least squares? Yes, no. Uh, but uh, maybe you could do that to some extent, but I'm not sure how useful it would be. Yeah, so it's a hard, that's a hard question to ask. Yeah. So um, you've seen the, the, the classic uh, uh, descent algorithm where basically you make an inexact uh, iteration. Yeah. Yeah. Let's look at this. This is, uh, you know, I didn't talk about stochastic at all, but Francis, you should ask him that when he talks about it more tomorrow or Thursday. Um, one way to 
to do that is that you should make a conscious attempt to touch all of the, if you've got a finite sum, you can make a conscious attempt to touch all of the FIs, right? So the way the classic stochastic gradient applied to this problem is you pick one of the i's at random. And on the next iteration, you pick another i at random, independently of the previous i. So in general, you have to be lucky to see all of the i's using the sort of coupon collector argument. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But if you're picking an i at random each time through from a collection of m items, with high probability, you end up picking all of the i's after about m log m iterations. OK. So, but if you systematically try to scroll through these in some you know, random order, um, you can get better behavior. And there's a, people are sort of starting to understand why that's true. It's not so obvious. But part of it is what is, has to do with what you're saying. And that when you do a complete pass through this, you've actually got something closer to the true gradient of the whole function than if you just pick i's at random every time. There are these algorithms called SAG and SAGA, which people, uh, Francis is probably an author on those papers, which are kind of combinations of true steepest descent with the entire function and stochastic dis gradient. There's, there's sort of a hybrid of those two things. And for those algorithms, they can get a more stable convergence behavior than just classic stochastic gradient. But you should ask uh, Francis about that when he talks tomorrow. It's a very interesting, it's still a very current area of research. Yeah, good question. I, I don't know. Uh, you, you could imagine you can imagine juggling the x and z, okay. Uh, but as I said, uh, here we go. Here we go. Here. You can imagine changing the order of the x and z, or picking them randomly, or something. Um, but as I said, uh, yeah, Eckstein claims that doing it this way is, in some sense, the best way computationally on the problems that he tried. He couldn't really improve on this by doing, you know, wild variations of this. Um, and I think he has some analysis to support why that's true. Um, there's a paper of him, and I think it's Yang, that appeared maybe last year where this is explained. Um, yeah, I mean, you, sh you should not be afraid to do crazy things here. That's, that's another motto, is that... Uh, a lot of developments that have happened have come from people just trying crazy things and then later on trying to understand why they work. Okay. So you should feel free to try things like that on your problems. And if they work, that's great. And then we can try to figure out why. Okay. Okay, so that's a very nice paper. Okay, so let's uh, thank Stephen again. Thank you.